we're back out here to the Canada Aviation and Space Museum in the World War One area to talk about World War One airplanes. Now, World War One airplanes in, aren't in and of themselves rare. A quick Google search shows there's roughly 200 or so in the world. Some are relatively original. Others are almost completely restored with very little original parts in them, but can still be considered original World War One aircraft. But what are original? Sorry, what are rare? What can be very rare are original World War One aircraft. Now, my researchers showed roughly 32 or so still exist in the world, and three of them are right here at the Canada Aviation Space Museum. And today, that's what we're going to look at. Now, there are a few museums in the world that do have a pretty large World War I collection. The Polish Aviation Museum in Krakow comes to mind with a lot of World War I German aircraft in their original unrestored state. But the Canada Aviation Museum having three definitely ranks up there with the top. And now, in order of kind of a rarity of what they have, the first one you can see here behind me, the uh, uh, Fokker DV-7. Um, as far as we can tell, this is the only original Fokker-built DV-7 in the world. A little farther down here, we have the Junkers J1, one of only two in the world, the other one only being a uh, fuselage section, and this is actually original as found in World War I, completely unrestored. We'll take a quick look at that one a little farther later. And then down the way over here, the only, the only World War I twin-engine bomber in existence. So let's take a quick look at some history of how we acquired these three items, and then we'll take a look at each aircraft in detail. The Fokker D7 was a late war German design entering service in January of 1918. While early war fighters were basically learning on the job, i.e. figuring out what a fighter should be while in combat, the D7 was a design built with every lesson learned up till that point. Its main improvement was the elimination of the support wires with the use of a mostly cantilever wing. There were still support struts on the outer wings, but the elimination of the support wires reduced weight as well as reduced drag, allowing the aircraft to fly faster for the given horsepower. Pilots loved the maneuverability of the aircraft, and enemies feared it for the same reason. With the end of the war and the requirement for Germany to de demilitarize, the D-7 was singled out to be destroyed due to its superior performance. Now, the United States took 142 for evaluation purposes, while Poland and Hungary both used captured examples in combat during the immediate post-war years. Anthony Fokker, the name behind the aircraft, smuggled a number of airframes out of Germany at the end of the war. Now, he did this by ensuring that his trains were too long for the border, the sidings located at the border, and the trains were quickly let across to keep the main line free. Now, France, Canada, and Great Britain all took some as war prizes, and today there are about seven original airframes on display in the world. Now, surprisingly, uh, this uh, Junker, uh, sorry, uh, Fokker DV-7 was not a Canadian war prize. It was actually acquired by the Aviation Museum in the 1970s, and this particular airframe was used in the filming of the famous Howard Hughes movie, The Hell's Angels. So it survived until then, we acquired it, and I'll get a little bit more detail here in a second to tell you the history of this airframe. Its history after the filming of the movie is a little bit murky but the Canada Aviation and Space Museum purchased it in 1971 and restoration began immediately, but was put on hold for other projects in 1975. The aircraft was sent to New Zealand sometime around 2015 for a full restoration and was returned in January of 2019 to be put on display. While much of the internal structure is original, it has had a full restoration, so the exterior is not original, although there is only one original in the world located in Brome, Quebec. So this behind me here, this is that Junkers J1 I was talking about. Now, uh, this uh, really is the only complete airframe in the world. As I mentioned, there is a fuselage section in a museum in Italy. And this is interesting because it is displayed as is. This was recovered in World War I, and I want to believe, let me double check my numbers here, it was 1917. Uh, this was recovered in the battlefield and was kept in an as-discovered condition. Um, all of it completely unrestored, exactly as it would have looked in World War I. Uh, very interesting aircraft. So let's go a little bit more detail into this one. The Junkers J-1 was built as a low-altitude ground attack and Army cooperation aircraft and was designed to be heavily armored. The forward fuselage was completely built out of solid sheet steel to protect both the engine and the crew. Production started in August of 1917 and only 227 were built when production ended in January of 1919. Pilots reportedly liked the aircraft, although the lumbering performance left something to be desired. It was designed to have two downward-firing machine guns to aid in strafing of trenches, but they were never used operationally because it was found to be too difficult to aim accurately. Near the end of the war, it was used to drop supplies to German troops near the front that were difficult to resupply by other means. 
Now, this airframe was captured as a war prize and shipped to Canada in 1919 and was put on display at the CNE in Toronto in September of 1919. It was then held by the RCAF in storage until 1939 when it was transferred to the Canada War Museum and then in 1969 to the Aviation Museum. The aircraft is displayed, as I stated earlier, in a completely unrestored condition and is the only complete Yonkers J-1 in the world. So this aircraft we have behind me here is the AEG G4, and this has the distinction of being the only German twin-engined or multi-engined aircraft to survive World War I, and obviously the only one of the AEG G4 still in existence. Uh, so this particular aircraft, uh, it was actually used as a, a medium bomber from 1917 through until 1918, and the construction of these aircraft actually were a little bit important because it was the first time that they had used steel, uh, tubular metal, tubular steel construction on the inside instead of using wood and fabric as well. This still has fabric, but it's got a steel internal construction. Crews enjoyed flying the AEG G4 as it was relatively easy to fly compared to other bombers, and up to seven missions had been recorded being flown by the same crew during one night. It carried a relatively decent bomb load of 880 pounds and had a four to five hour endurance. Now the museum's example was taken as a war prize at the end of World War I and was shipped to Canada in 1919, one of about 36 German aircraft brought to Canada after the war, and very few of those 36 aircraft exist today. From what I can tell, this aircraft was used during a touring show of Canada, and here's a picture I can find of it in Hamilton, although with no year attached. Shows it sitting without its engines very early in its life with just props hung roughly in the right place. Here's a later picture of it in storage in Ottawa, disassembled and looking a little worse for wear. It was eventually transferred to RCAF Station Borden for storage, and in 1939, with the buildup of World War II, it was offered to the National Research Council's Aeronautical Museum. When they declined, it was put into storage in the War Museum in Ottawa. In 1968, it was donated to the Aviation Museum and was sent to Trenton for restoration. At this point, in addition to the engines, the wheels had also gone missing. The fabric was replaced, although the original was saved and the current lozenge pattern is a very close representation of the German night scheme. And smaller Mercedes engines were found, 180 horsepower versus the original 260 horsepower units, and CF100 main wheels were installed. When the new museum building was completed, the aircraft was moved over and new wooden mock-up wheels were constructed to make the aircraft look more original. And they are still looking for original engines, so if anybody knows of any, you know who to contact. So there we have it, three relatively rare World War I German aircraft on display here. As always, I'd like to thank the Canada Aviation and Space Museum for graciously letting me come in here and film. And as always, we'll see you all next time. Thank you for watching, guys. And as always, if you are interested in any of the content you see, you can access my website at www.shans-aviation.com. Uh, you can see all the uh, latest pictures of aircraft and museums and the build logs of all of my current models and past models on that site. And if you're interested in any of this content, uh, please click the subscribe button here on uh, YouTube to follow more. Thank you very much and see you guys next time.